This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. We have a very special person in the audience today, and his name is Dr. Terry Shintani, MD. <laughs> and I'd like to invite him to come up to the front and say a couple of words before we get started. Okay, aloha, everyone. I just wanted to say a couple of things about Dr. Greger. As you know, I'm on the, the advisory board of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and to me, people like Dr. Greger is the future of medicine because as you know our healthcare system is failing. How many agree with that? Right. So I'm very pleased to have Dr. Greger here and I'm also pleased that we have invited some of our medical students who are rotating through our complementary alternative medicine uh, department. Can you raise your hand if you're a medical student? So the new breed of doctors are going to learn about this way of healing. I just wanted to present Dr. Greger. A lot of people see these in the stores for tourists, but actually the kukui nut is a symbol of a healer. So I wanted to give this welcome to our guests this evening. Thank you, Dr. Terry Shintani. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. It's good to see all of you here tonight. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, since 1990, has continued to follow our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest vegetarian societies in the nation. Our members receive an informative newsletter as well as discounts at grocery stores such as at Down to Earth, all vegetarian, organic, and natural, and at many vegan and vegetarian friendly restaurants. We're thrilled to announce a new discount tonight. Thank you to Licious Dishes, which is now offering their flavorful raw food dishes at a 5% discount to VSH members. Your membership will more than pay for itself, even if you spend only $10 a week on groceries or on eating out. So please join tonight before you leave or join online at vsh.org. I'd now like to acknowledge our hardworking meeting volunteers. There is UH Professor Emeritus, Dr. Carl Seff, sitting at the reception table. And I see Patrick at the literature table, and Denise was there um, helping to sell Dr. Greger's DVDs, which, by the way, are all, um, all of the profits from those are given away to charity. So please feel free to take advantage of all the good information on those DVDs. We also have Dr. Bill Harris at the video camera. And we've got Angie and Carl again in the kitchen. Angie is also bringing our refreshments from down to earth tonight. Thanks to all of you who have volunteered recently. We've been asking a number of you to help us to publicize this talk. If any of you are here tonight that have been on our volunteer uh, mailing list, like to see a show of hands? Anybody? Oh, yeah. OK, thank you. Very, we really appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much. By the way, we also don't always mention Patrick Conair, but he's here tonight somewhere in the, I don't, I'm not sure where he is at the moment. Hiding. Hiding. Okay, there he is, hiding uh, behind the other Patrick at the free literature table. <laughs> anyway, but he's been faithfully distributing and posting our meeting flyers for many years. Thank you all very, very much. We'd also like to thank again this month Risa Comsey, a University of Hawaii senior who's chosen to help VSH as, as her senior learning project. She organized a VSH table for us at the University of Hawaii Manoa campus on March 21st and then again last week on April 4th and will be helping us again tomorrow when you can come visit VSH at our table at the Be the Change event at Honolulu Community College from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. 
We're recording tonight's presentation for a broadcast on the VSH TV series Vegetarian, which appears on public access channels across the state, including on Oahu's Olelo Channel 52. You can also view videos of this and many of our past presentations on our website, vsh.org, where you'll find also lots of other great information, including recipes, our famous dining guide, as well as past newsletters. It is now time for our special guest. We're delighted to welcome back Dr. Michael Greger, MD. Yay. <laughs> A founding member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Michael Greger, MD, is a physician, author, and internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. He has lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before Congress, and was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial. He is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. Currently, Dr. Greger serves as the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. Hundreds of his nutrition videos are freely available at nutritionfacts.org, which is added to daily. His presentation tonight is entitled, The Latest in Human Nutrition. Please welcome Dr. Michael Greger. Aloha. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, Every year, I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so you don't have to. <laughs> so every year, as you've seen in previous years, my presentation is brand new because the science is brand new. I then compile all the most interesting, the most groundbreaking, the most kind of practical results into a quiz show format. Throughout the presentation, I'll ask everyone to stand up. We'll pull back the curtain, play a few games. If you get the answer right, you get to remain standing. If you get the answer wrong, you need to sit down. And we'll keep going to see who the last person is standing. Any questions before we begin? Doesn't anybody want to know what they win? Last person standing each round will win a brand new CD-ROM I created containing thousands, literally thousands, of the latest, greatest articles published in the scientific nutrition literature categorized by topic. Your own personal nutrition library on a disc. It is not for sale, even if you beg. You've got to win it. Most everything I'm going to talk about today was taken off my Volume 5 DVD. Um, all proceeds go to charity, of course, as was mentioned. Let's start at the top with the antioxidant content of 3,139 foods. In the beginning, blueberries were the best. Then walnuts took the title, and then wild blueberries took it back. And then small red beans were considered the number one most antioxidant-packed food on the planet until herbs and spices were tested. Frankly, I thought it was over in 2007. The USDA had tested hundreds of uh, foods, 277 foods. Now, when only 40 foods were tested, sure, blueberries were number one. But when hundreds of foods were tested, blueberries no longer even made the top ten. And if you remember, I ranked them for you by serving size, ranked them for you by unit cost, kind of antioxidant bang for your buck. Mission accomplished until last year. The total antioxidant content of more than 3,000 foods, the most comprehensive such study ever uh, by far. I mean, are there even 3,000 foods out there? Right. Looking at the first page of the 138 page chart in the study, you know you're in for a wild ride when they don't just include something as exotic as gooseberries or Indian gooseberries or Indian gooseberries in a can, but even the antioxidant content of the syrup in a can of Indian gooseberries. They tested 
30 different beers for those of us who stay awake all night wondering whether there's more antioxidants in Coors or Bud Light. And the answer? Miller, by a hair, actually. <laughs> Nothing compared to Santa Claus beer, though, which beat out Guinness and put all the rest to shame. Don't laugh. The standard American diet is so pitiful that beer actually represents the fifth largest sources of anti antioxidants in the American diet in the United States. They measured cap and crunch. <laughs> they measured the antioxidant content of Tootsie Rolls. Everything from Krispy Kreme to the crushed dried leaves of the African baobab tree. The skim and organic lemon Norwegian jungle dessert, whatever that is, took them eight years to compile this data, but now it is ours. So what practical implications does this have in terms of, you know, day-to-day -day grocery store decisions? Well, what about those new gold kiwi fruit on the market now? Are they better than the original green? Let's get everybody up and find out. With a show of hands, you only get to choose one. Who thinks the original green is the best? Raise your hand. How many people think, no, the gold are better? And the answer is, the gold are four times better. So if you did not choose gold, please sit down. We'll go on to the next round. So even if the gold kiwi fruits are twice as expensive, three times as expensive, it still makes sense to gold for the gold. And as you can see, there's like the smart side of the room, and then the... All right. All right. Those of you who got that right, I'll have you sit down. But remember who you are. I'll get just you back up for the next round. I actually want to just take a step back for a moment to see what this amazing new body of work has to say about what we should eat in general. The first thing the authors did, if you can see this, so this is table one, was to split everything up into animal foods, versus plant foods. All right. Here's the average antioxidant content of plant foods, 1,157. Here's the average of animal foods, 18. All right. On average, meat, fish, eggs, dairy has 64 times fewer antioxidants than plant foods. And this alone represents a powerful argument to transition towards a more plant-based diet. Because every time you choose something in this column, you miss out on an opportunity to choose something in that column. Animal foods max out at 100. Plant foods go up to 289,000. But is this really a fair comparison? I mean, included in the plant group were things you could never really find in a grocery store, like exotic wild berries, which really kind of skewed the chart upwards for the plant foods, gave them an unfair advantage. I mean, people eat things like corn. They don't eat dried Norwegian corn flowers, right? So let's bring it down to earth. The average plant food does have more than 1,000 units of antioxidant power. But just to be fair to the animal foods, uh, always got to feel bad for the underdog, for comparison's sake, I'm going to choose the least healthy plant food I can think of, and that is good old American iceberg lettuce, which I think of as basically you know, water in lettuce form. It does not have 1,000 units of antioxidant power like your average plant food. It has 17. As you can see, I dropped the scale down. So this is up here is just 100. So this is way down at the bottom in terms of foods with the lowest amount of these anti-aging, anti-cancer, antioxidants. So as plants go, lettuce is a loser. Only about 1% of the nutrition in the average plant food still beats out fish, though, which came in at 7. Comes in at 11. Salmon comes in at 7. Chicken comes in at 6. And so iceberg lettuce has nearly three times the antioxidant content of chicken. Iceberg lettuce. Hard-boiled egg, two. Egg beaters, which is just the whites, zero. Even Coca-Cola's got four. <laughs> which, um, ironically, is the amount that's found in cow's milk and yogurt, although uh, soy milk only has about twice that. So while plant foods average over 1,000, the best animal foods can do in the meat category is the liver of an ox at 71. All right. 
beats out moose meat, reindeer steak. I told you they measured everything. But even ox livers couldn't quite reach the antioxidant power of a candy bar. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason we need to eat a plant-based diet because even if we lived off of ox livers, the wild blueberry of the animal kingdom, we would never come close to our daily antioxidant needs. I do have to say, though, that there was one animal product that does kick some serious tush, oh, topping over 200. There's even some berries that aren't that antioxidant rich. An animal product so healthy, I must encourage everyone to consume it when you're a baby. That's human breast milk. That's uh, the antioxidant content of human breast milk, the only healthy animal product for human consumption. During infancy, breast is best. After infancy, plants are preferred. <laughs> Next up, eggs. The egg industry recently got their huevos handed to them in this devastating new review in the uh, Canadian Journal of Cardiology by three academic heavy hitters, Dr. David Spence, who's the director of Atherosclerosis Research Center. David Jenkins is the guy who invented the glycemic index and Dr. Davignon, the director of the Hyperlipidemia and Atherosclerosis Research Group. Now, the last time Dr. Spence spoke out against eggs, his house got its cholesterol raised too. But the reason they felt the need to uh, set the record straight is that you know, recent media reports were reflecting a remarkable effectiveness of the sustained propaganda campaign by the egg industry to downplay the risks of cholesterol. See, the fundamental flaw that they point out in the studies that the egg industry uses to muddy the waters on the subject is that the egg industry studies only measure fasting cholesterol levels, which just reflects what's happening in your arteries in the few hours before you wake up, not when you, after you've eaten breakfast. And when you actually measure your cholesterol during the day, when most people live their lives in a postprandial state, not only do eggs make your bad cholesterol go up, but for hours after you eat, um, uh, it increases the susceptibility of your bad cholesterol to oxidation, vascular inflammation, oxidative stress, and postpandrial hyperlipidemia. That potentiates the harmful effects of saturated fat, impairs the function of the lining of your arteries, and increases cardiovascular events, which is another way of saying heart attacks. So fine, an omelet may not be a good idea, but how much cholesterol could there be in just like one egg? All right, well, a single egg yolk contains between 215 to 275 milligrams cholesterol, depending on the size. So the yolk of a large egg provides more than the 210 found in a Hardy's Monster Thick Burger, two-thirds a pound of beef, three slices of cheese, four strips of bacon. Right. Now, the media storm that followed the publication of this paper compared the egg to the fast food monstrosity du jour, the KFC Double Down, where even the bun is made out of meat and it asks which came worst, the chicken or the egg. A single egg yolk, therefore, exceeds the recommended daily intake of cholesterol. So one egg, and you can just eat celery the whole rest of the day, and you can be over the limit. Now, the egg industry, however, would rather blame the bacon and hash browns. That's the problem, they say. Railing against the so-called myth that eggs are the most concentrated source of cholesterol in the American diet, and it turns out they're right. According to the USDA Nutrient Database, eggs are not the number one most concentrated source of cholesterol. They're actually number two. Brains are number one. Veal brains, cow brains, pork brains, lamb brains, raw pork brains, more veal brains, and only then do you get to eggs. Then more brains, eggs, brains, brains, eggs, brains, eggs, and eggs. So the only population at higher risk than egg eaters, zombies. <laughs> the take home message here, if you're gonna do veal brains, definitely pan fried, not braised, because that's just, that's crazy. This devastating new review implicating egg consumption did not go over easy with the egg industry. They countered that the overly restrictive 200 milligram upper safety limit for cholesterol intake that wouldn't even allow a single egg in a day is only for people at risk for heart disease, to which the lead researcher replied, look, most everyone 
is at risk for vascular disease. The only ones who should eat an egg yolk regularly with impunity would be those who expect to die prematurely from non-vascular causes. In other words, his famous, the only people who should eat eggs regularly are those with a terminal illness. Right? Because then, doesn't matter, you know, bungee jump, whatever you want, because you're going to die, drop dead anyway, so it doesn't matter what you eat. In their landmark review, they concluded that, look, waiting for your first stroke, heart attack, diabetes diagnosis before avoiding eggs, it's too late. Stopping egg consumption after a heart attack or stroke uh, would be like quitting smoking after lung cancer is diagnosed. A unnecessary act, but late. Now, but the egg industry loves to boast, though, that eggs have these two compounds, lutein and zeaxanthin. What the egg industry does is they feed hens marigold petals and alfalfa and yellow corn, anything to boost the egg content up to 166 micrograms per large egg. So they say, look, don't worry about the cholesterol. Eat eggs to protect your sight. And actually, eggs have been measured having up to 250 micrograms per large egg. A cup of carrots, though, has over 1,000. A single serving of collard greens closer to 15,000 and kale tops the charts at 24,000, leaving eggs in the dust. One single spoonful of spinach has as much as nine eggs. One spoonful. Now for eye protection, the recommendation is to get 10,000 a day, all right? 10,000 a day. What does that mean? Well, that's about a third a cup of spinach. All right, that's doable. Or 40 eggs. More than three cartons of eggs every day. That's nutrition unscrambled, according to the egg industry. Here are the top 10 sources of these critical eyesight saving nutrients. Where are they found? All greens all the way down the list, all right? Eggs don't even make the top 100 sources. To get to eggs, you have to scroll down a few pages, and according to the USDA, eggs come in right behind, here's eggs, Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries, right? <laughs> and then eggs, right? There are more phytonutrients in Crunch Berries than there are in eggs. Right. What? New developments do we have in the battle against breast cancer, the number one cancer killer among young women? Well, most breast tumors are estrogen receptor positive, meaning they respond to estrogen. Estrogen makes them grow. The problem for tumors in postmenopausal women, though, is that uh, there isn't much estrogen around, unless, of course, you take it in a drug like Premarin, made out of pregnant mare's urine, which doesn't uh, appear to improve the quality of women's life, but decreases the quantity, increasing the risk of strokes, heart attacks, blood clots, breast cancer. Thankfully, when this discovered in 2002, millions of women stopped taking uh, Premarin, stopped taking hormone replacement therapy, and we saw a really nice drop in breast cancer rates um, when women did that. But as you can see, since then, breast cancer rates have stagnated. Hundreds of thousands of women American women continue to get this dreaded diagnosis every year, so what's next? Well, with no estrogen around, what many breast tumors do is they devise a nefarious plan. They'll just make their own. 70% of breast tumor cells uh, synthesize estrogen themselves using an enzyme called aromatase. And so drug companies have produced a number of aromatase inhibitor drugs that are used as chemotherapy agents, but of course by the time you're on chemotherapy it can be just a little late. So researchers started screening hundreds of natural dietary compounds to find something, anything, that could target this enzyme. Uh, now to do this, you need a lot of human tissue. Where are you going to get it from? Well, to study human skin, they actually use human foreskins, right? Instead of throwing them away, they actually use the source of tissue. Where are you going to get female tissue from placentas. They actually had thousands of women donate their placentas after birth um, to further this critical line of research. And after years of searching, they found seven vegetables that significantly, uh, that have significant anti-aromatase activity. And here they are. Seven different vegetables dro dropping aromatase activity um, by about 20%. Whoa, except this one, right? That's like 60, 65% drop which one was it? Bell pepper, broccoli, carrots, celery, green, onions, 
mushrooms or spinach. Let's get those up. Who got the kiwi fruit one right? Just those. And we will go on to our next round. Of those standing, first of all, anyone who's sitting down want a shout out advice for our remaining contestants, what do you think? All right, of those standing, how many people think bell peppers were the best? How many people think broccoli, carrots, celery, green onions, also known as scallions, plain white button mushrooms, or spinach? All right, let's find out. Well, it was not green onions, not celery, not carrots, not bell peppers, not broccoli. That's what I would have guessed. Um, not spinach, but X marks the spots. Mushrooms. Ah, how many people are still? Wave your hands if you're still in the game. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, very good. All right, I'll have you sit back down and get just you back up. We are close to having our first winner here. Which one is the best, though? How many do you have to eat? Uh, I don't have time to get to that, but would have to address that. Oh, yeah. And don't have time to talk about this either, but again, I'd be happy to talk about it in Q&A. Uh, multivitamins increase the risk of breast cancer, but I'll leave that to the DVD. Earlier this year, or actually last year now, a study was published comparing the estrogen levels, uh, hormonal levels of women with and without breast cancer. So if estrogen makes breast cancer grow, one would assume that women with breast cancer might have higher levels of these hormones in the circulating in their bodies compared to the women who don't, or at least don't yet. And indeed, no surprise, that's exactly what they found. Significantly more estrogen circulating through the bodies of those with breast cancer compared to those um, without. But what they also looked at was diets and hormonal levels. These were all women eating mixed diets. The vegetarian women did significantly better. And this may explain why, in a study, of the relative risk for breast cancer by levels of animal product consumption as one gets more and more plant-based, there seems to be a stepwise trend towards lower breast cancer risk in those of uh, kind of the more vegetarian someone eats. And it was researchers at my alma mater, Tufts, that figured out why, um, published this landmark article in the New England Journal of Medicine. See, the way our bodies get rid of cholesterol is they dump it into the digestive tract knowing full well that our digestive tract is going to be packed with fiber. Lots of fiber in there to grab it, hold on to it, and then flush it out of our body. So I hope you chew a little bit better than that. <laughs> we did, after all, evolve for quite a long time before Wonder Bread and the established, royal establishments of uh, you know, Burger King and Dairy Queen. Our body just expects it. Right? It just assumes our intestines are going to be packed with fiber all day long. About seven times more, over 100, we evolved getting over 100 grams of fiber a day, something that very few people even come close to. Now look, we did evolve eating some meat, but plants don't tend to run as fast, and so the bulk of our diet was made up of a lot of bulk. And that's how our body gets rid of estrogen, excess estrogen as well. Vegetarian women have increased fiber input, and so vegetarian women have increased fecal output, which leads to increased fecal excretion of estrogen and decreased blood concentrations of estrogen. And this just wasn't in theory. They measured it. Uh, subjects were provided with plastic bags and insulated boxes filled with dry ice for three 24-hour fecal collections. You've heard of popsicles. It's more like poopsicles. It's... <laughs> And here you go, in any one 24-hour period, the vegetarians are fecally excreting more than twice as much estrogen as the omnivores, and measuring estrogen excretion versus fecal stool size, as you can see, the bigger the better. You can see all these heavyweight Vs versus the welterweight Os here. Right? No wonder vegetarian women in the United States have been found to have such lower rates of breast cancer. So yes, it's great that so many women stop taking hormone replacement therapy, stop taking extra estrogens, but another way that uh, one can rid oneself of excess estrogens is in the way that nature intended. The bigger our bowel movements, the healthier we may be. Low stool weight uh, has been associated with risk for bowel cancer and diverticular disease and appendicitis, various anal diseases, even the healthfulness of breast tissue. This is from a study of 23 populations across a dozen countries, a graph of 
average daily stool weight versus colon cancer incidence. As you can see, high stool weight, low cancer, right? Low stool weight, high cancer rates, right? Um, once you start to uh, get down about half a pound, 200 grams or so, you can see uh, uh, colon cancer incidence really starts to skyrocket. And once you start dropping quarter pounders, we're talking about a quadrupling of colon cancer incidence. Right? The link between stool size and uh, cancer may be related to transit time, the number of hours it takes food to get from one end to the other. The larger our stool, the quicker the transit time because it's easier for our bodies to kind of move things along. How long it takes for food to get from one end to another depends on two things, gender and eating style. If you're a vegetarian male, one or two days. That's all it should take. How, so this is vegetarians, non-vegetarians, men and women. Um, however, if you're a meat-eating man, it could be up to five days. Um, for women, vegetarian women, again, mostly one or two days. However, the average transit time, the average mouth-to-anus transit time for meat-eating women in the United States is four days. All right? People don't realize you can have daily bowel movements and still be effectively constipated. Right? You can be regular but four days late. What you're flushing down today, you may have eaten last week, and that's not good in terms of cancer risk. If you want to test for yourself, all you have to do is eat a big bowl of beets and see when things turn pretty and pink. We're looking for 24 to 36 hours. That's the goal. That's what we're looking for. And if it is indeed just a day or two, so this is in hours, um, so if it is just um, uh, a day or two, we're going to go out and we're going to hit that 200 gram minimum daily stool weight that we're looking for in terms of minimizing cancer incidence. However, if you're way up here, like the average median woman, as you can see, you're never going to make it. You're never going to make it out to 200 grams, right? Now, if you have a really good scale, bathroom scale, you can measure stool weight directly by, of course, measuring yourself before and after. <clears throat> I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> Who's number one at number two? The country with the largest bowel movements. What do you think? Is it Denmark, India, Japan, New Zealand, South Africa, Tonga, an island in the South Pacific, UK or the US of A. Here's the graph. As you can see, only two countries made that 200 gram cutoff and all the other countries fell short. First of all, though, let's guess this one. The country with the smallest bowel movement. Let's get our remaining few contestants up. Who got the last one right? There were three over here and all right. Okay. Who thinks the f f it would be fun to go around the room and find out, but uh, speed things up. Who thinks the fecal featherweight is Denmark? Raise your hand. How many people think it's India? Denmark. How many people think it's Japan? How many people think the smallest is New Zealand? How many people think South Africa? Tonga? UK? US of A? Look at that patriotism there. Let's see. <laughs> And red, white, and blue poo it is. USA, right. How many people we still got in the game? We got one, two, three, four, five, six. We have one over here. Very nice. Okay. Um, well, okay, then let's, uh, let's go up here to number one. The other end of the scale, the largest bowel movements. What do you think? India number one. What do you think in the back? You, that's you. Another, another India. Tonga. Japan. Another Tonga. Anybody else that I missed? All right, let's find out. And the winner of the Bowels of the Earth contest was Tonga at 531. Congratulations, we have two winners this round. All right, and the only other country to make the 200 gram minimum, excellent guess, was India, um, which um, averaged 311, but with individual measurements all the way up to 1,505 grams a day, that's a lot of samosas, that's pretty impressive. <laughs>
And as you can see, Japan, another good guess, almost made the 200 gram cutoff, but every other country fell short. Now, U.S. vegetarians did significantly better than the rest of the population, and, and U.S. Uh, and U.K. vegetarians, and particularly vegans. There was actually one population that did worse than the average American population, the population with the smallest average bowel movement side, size ever recorded, and that was New Yorkers. <laughs> Three ounces a day. <laughs> if they'd actually just eat a big apple once in a while, maybe. <laughs> All right. Where are we? Okay, but wait a second. What, what are they eating in Tonga at the other end of the scale? Well, this was actually taken, this was measured when they were eating their traditional plant-based diet, as uh, Dr. Shintani will tell you, of roots and greens and sweet potatoes and fruit and more greens and bananas, cabbage, etc. Now, Tragically, the most frequently consumed food item in the country, no, not spam, but close, imported chicken parts. Number one food consumed, and this is what happened. From one of the healthiest nations in the world to one of the fattest nations in the world, thanks in part, so it says the most obese now, thanks in part to the westernization of their diets. All right. Oh, it's getting a little late. I'm going to skip over um, improving mood through diet, inflammation. Um, oh, da, da, da. oh, actually, today the Canadian seal hunt started, fortunately, and the egg industry actually feeds seal blubber from, from, these, from the Canadian seal hunt to hens to lower their economic acid level and make eggs a little less dangerous for people. Um, but I don't have time to talk about that. Or fish oil, canned tuna. All right, but let me hit... Uh, who could pass on brain worms? The most common cause of adult onset epilepsy in the world is called neurocystocercosis, which uh, literally means pork tapeworms curled up inside our brains. The most common cause of epilepsy. A few last year out of the Mayo Clinic describes the problem cystocerci, meaning the pork tapeworm larvae create cavities in the brain and other parts of the body where their um, tiny bodies grow sometimes into tapeworms two to seven meters in length and can live up to 25 years in the human body. For those of us not metric, that's 23 feet long, right, seven meters. On MRI, these so-called uh, wormholes appear. You can see all those. Using a different uh, kind of brain scan, you get what's called the starry sky sign, which many of the medical students will may be familiar with which we learn. And each one of these so-called stars is a fluid-filled cyst with the beginning of a living, growing tapeworm inside. Uh, this is what uh, they look like on autopsy. This is what their faces look like. They have these rows of hooks to kind of grab onto us. Earlier this year, a review was published by the CDC on the public health implications of cystocercosis acquired in the United States. This used to be a problem in the developing world, but it is now um, uh, rife throughout the United States. Pork tapeworms on the brain has emerged as a cause of severe neurological disease in the United States. And, you know, even after the pork tapeworm larvae infect our brain, some people can go remain asymptomatic their entire lives. You don't even know you have them while others can go for years um, without symptoms until all of a sudden people become very ill and we're not sure exactly what triggers them and you can get seizures, headaches, etc. as they multiply in your system and then you die from sudden death from just the pressure buildup in your brain. Uh, another review last year confirmed that pork tapeworms taking up residence inside our brains is a significant public health issue um, here in the United States now. At first, though, clinical diagnosis can be challenging. Right? Initial presentations of the disease can be vague. Things like, you know, headaches or dizziness, high blood pressure, that kind of thing. Now, in terms of treatment, in a series of more than 100 cases published recently, although these antiparasitic deworming drugs have been found to be useful, about 10% of victims require brain surgery what's called an open craniotomy, where you actually have to go in and kind of dig them out. And now they can get into our muscles too. Um, as you can see here, this is just a plain radiograph here. You can see how kind of infested the muscle is um, with these worms. And of course, that's how you can get it from pork, right? Because it, it infects the muscles. But what if we don't eat pig muscles? Well, to all the smug non-pork eaters out there, 
If we can find pork tapeworms in the brains of Orthodox Jews living in Brooklyn, we can find pork tapeworms in a lot of people. Now, they weren't sneaking off for schnitzel here. This was, it was their pork-eating domestic house workers, right, preparing their food. When 1,700 members of the local uh, synagogue congregation were tested, 1% came up positive, and the researchers suggested, look, those who are to be employed by us as domestic food workers, uh, food handlers, should first be screened for tapeworm infection, and that means uh, examination of three stool samples. You thought the pee in a cup was bad? This is a job interview here. That's, That's serious. So to avoid our number one cause of adult onset epilepsy, we may want to not eat pork and not eat anything made by people who eat pork. Medicare is in trouble. Where or where could we possibly save some money? Well, according to the American Heart Association, cardiovascular disease alone costs our nation a half trillion dollars a year, so no wonder. And one of the most exciting new developments of the year Certainly the most exciting development for lifestyle medicine. Medicare finally started reimbursing for payment the Ornish program for reversing heart disease as well as the Pritikin program. Hospitals can now get paid for reversing heart disease with diet instead of just queuing up people for their next bypass operation when their last graft gets clogged up too. Now, you know, most people have heard of Dean Ornish, right, but may not be aware of Nathan Pritikin. Right, the original lifestyle medicine pioneer who started reversing um, heart disease uh, through diet you know, back in the 70s, as you can tell by his getup here. Um, in fact, on a personal note, Pritikin is the reason why this little freckled fellow went to medical school. <laughs> you know, I think the, I think the spark for many kids to want to you know, be a doctor when they grow up is watching a parent get sick, grandparent get sick or even die. But for me, it was watching my grandma get better. This is my grandma at her grandson's wedding 15 years after doctors had abandoned her to die. Right? She'd already had so many bypass operations that basically there's nothing more they could do. They sent her home. Um, they just kind of ran out of plumbing. Right? Wheelchair bound, crushing chest pain, and then she heard about Pritikin, which is kind of a live-in program. You go, they put you on a plant-based diet, teach you how to cook. They wheeled her in, and she walked out. I'll never, uh, never forget that. And you know, as a kid, that's all that matters, get to play with Grandma again. But she was given her medical death sentence at age 65, and thanks to a healthy diet, she was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet with her six grandkids, including me. She's even mentioned in the official Pritikin biography, the man who healed America's heart. These were the death's door people recalled an early administrator, like Francis Greger, who appeared uh, in a wheelchair. Uh, Greger had heart disease, angina, claudication. Her condition so bad she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of her wheelchair, but she was walking 10 miles a day. Now, in the end, my grandma's miraculous recovery from terminal heart disease is, as remarkable as it was, is just one anecdote among many. Although, certainly, it inspired me to pursue a career um, in medicine. It wasn't, uh, you know, I've always had a skeptical streak, and it wasn't until, uh, I wasn't personally convinced, until Ornish's landmark study was published in one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world in 1990, which, you know, clobbered me over the head with enough science to change my own diet forever. Now, Pritikin had been reversing heart disease with diet for decades before Ornish came along, but here it was, in black and white, in, again, in The Lancet. The so Ornish proved that you cannot just prevent heart disease, not just slow down the progression of heart disease, not just stop heart disease without drugs, without surgery, but you could actually reverse heart disease, open up clogged arteries. And since then, since 1990, millions have died. Totally unnecessary deaths. My grandma didn't have to die like that. No one's grandma has to die like that. We have the miracle cure We've had it for decades, yet hardly anyone knows about it. Wait a second, though. If we can reverse heart disease, right, without drugs, without surgery, then great. Hey, doesn't that mean 
We can eat whatever the heck we want. And then once we feel a little chest pain, oh, okay, get with the program, start eating healthy, open up our arteries back up, you know, eat as healthy as we need to be. Um, uh, here's the problem with the plan. The problem with the plan is called sudden cardiac death. Our first symptom may be our last. What do they mean by sudden cardiac death? Well, it's defined in medical terms as sudden unexpected death within an hour of your first symptom in someone without any previous symptoms or known cardiac condition, right? You had no idea you had heart disease until you die. Most of us know that number one killer of both men and women every year for the last 78 years, heart disease. But what people may not know is that for the majority of people that die with heart disease, the symptoms don't start years before you die, but literally minutes before you die, right? The first symptom occurs literally minutes before your death, right? In our last hour on this earth, right, in agony, all the dietary change in the world isn't going to help, right? Even if the paramedics snatch away our chicken wings, refuse to stop at our favorite fast food joint on the way to the hospital, I'm afraid it may just be too late. One moment we can be with our family feeling fine, and less than an hour later, gone forever, right? The number one cause of death in America is not just heart disease, but it's sudden cardiac death. People dropping dead even in their 30s, 40s, 50s, right? So is this just what happens when you get old? You know, your ticker conks out on you, the pump kind of wears out? No. And that's why Dr. T. Colin Campbell's work was so revolutionary, and he's the reason I went to Cornell. At the same time Ornish was studying hundreds of people on plant-based diets, Dr. Campbell and colleagues were studying hundreds of thousands. Here's just one of the 894 pages of the official Oxford Cornell China study, let me share just one statistic. Guizhou County in China, where among a population of 246,000 men over a three year period, not a single recorded death from coronary artery disease. Right? That was in the US, that many men, that many years. There could be thousands of deaths, instead, not one. There is nothing natural about getting or dying from heart disease. The fact is that a good vegan diet is likely to reduce the risk for most types of cancer, ischemic heart disease, and its complications. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, osteoporosis, multiple sclerosis, gallstones, renal stones, appendicitis, diverticulitis, hiatal hernia, varicose veins, hemorrhoids, and possibly the chief metabolic complications of pregnancy disorders, which collectively are responsible for the majority of deaths and hospitalizations in Western society, that should be sufficient to recommend it. And those, of course, who are willing to make less striking changes in the lifestyle can be encouraged to reduce their consumption of animal products as much as possible. Um, uh, the paper ends with a simple injunction. Do not eat animal products has the potential to do more for the world's health than all the abstruse wisdom and all the world's medical libraries put together. Now, in the process of writing this research paper on the comparative endocrinological effects of animal versus plant protein, the researcher himself was overwhelmed by the balance of evidence and disclosed that, you know, uh, during the course of writing and researching this article, my findings compelled me to eat this way as well. Now, but why don't more in the scientific and medical communities embrace a plant-based diet, if indeed the evidence is so overwhelming? Well, part of the reason may be the tomato effect, which is the final topic I will cover this evening. Coined in the Journal of the American Medical Association 28 years ago, the tomato effect describes the rejection of highly efficacious therapies by the medical establishment simply because they happen to go against the prevailing conventional wisdom of the time. Why do they call it the tomato effect? Well, imported from the New World by the 1860, the tomato was a staple of the European diet, but it was actively shunned for literally centuries in North America. And the reason, but tomatoes were shunned for literally centuries in North America, and the reason was simple. They were poisonous. 
Everyone knew they were poisonous, at least everyone in North America. It was obvious. In fact, it wasn't until 1820 when some dude got on the steps of a courthouse, ate a tomato, and survived. <laughs> Did things finally change? And those same tomatoes are now a billion dollar crop here in the United States. And so the authors describe examples in medicine of this so-called tomato effect, this slavish devotion to orthodoxy. For example, ignoring the successful use of this plant for uh, about a thousand years before modern medicine discovered it was um, the drug colchicine. Aspirin was also ignored for about 3,000 years of successful use as willow tree bark extract. Uh, but I'd like to extend this tomato effect analogy into the field of nutrition. For example, thousands died of scurvy, the vitamin C deficiency disease, for a hundred years after lemon juice was found to cure it. Why? Because at the time, disease was considered an imbalance of the humors. So what possible role could a fruit play? Right? A century later, in the mid-1800s, Humanity came up with this bright idea to polish rice from brown to white, causing an epidemic of sudden death from heart attack in Asia. Millions died of beriberi, a vitamin B deficiency. See, now we add B vitamins to white rice to enrich it, to fortify it. But back then, if you switch from brown rice to white rice, you can get beriberi, a vitamin B deficiency, and you die. It uh, poisons the heart muscle, and so you actually die of heart disease. Millions died, but again, the cure was discovered. Rice bran, the brown part of rice, or rice bran tea, yet there were decades of death before the medical community finally woke up and started using the cure that worked. And today, there is another epidemic of heart disease. It too is caused by diet, and it too has a cure. How long must we wait? Thank you. Most importantly, all my work is available for free online on my website, nutritionfacts.org. Hundreds of videos on more than a thousand topics. Oh, okay. So the question was, oh, could, you, could I say why mushrooms should be cooked? It's something that I covered in a previous lecture, kind of surprising. Another doctor I have great respect for is Dr. Joel Furman in New Jersey, who said, you got to cook your mushrooms. I said, cook them all. Why should we cook? Okay. Well, it turns out that there's this natural toxin found in just plain white button mushrooms called the garotene, which is utterly destroyed by cooking. And so because of that reason, we really should cook our mushrooms. Now, having said that, mushrooms are incredibly healthy. Healthy. The more we learn about mushrooms, the more we are just amazed by mushrooms. And, you know, we should eat a kind of a variety uh, in our diet, so mo many different types of plant families. So we should eat, you know, roots and stems and leaves, and they all have different properties because they all have, you know, different. But we're talking about a whole other kingdom. We're talking about fungi, which has a whole other, you know, a whole different kind of metabolic process and has all sorts of interesting substances that do different things. And so I encourage people to eat mushrooms. In fact, eat mushrooms every day, but I would I indeed encourage you to cook them because of this natural toxin called the garotene in raw mushrooms. So the question is, how long do you have to cook them? Once they start sweating, once they start releasing moisture, you know, if you like saute them or any way you cook them, I mean, once, uh, once they're, then that's all it takes. I mean, it's a very kind of uh, heat unstable compound. Oh, that's a fantastic question. The question was, why would a multivitamin increase a woman's risk for breast cancer? And the, and the answer is, we don't know, but they had some theories. Um, so these were, they basically took lots of women, they asked, do you take a multivitamin, do you not take a multivitamin? And they tried to control for other factors. Maybe women who take multivitamins, you know, don't exercise as much or have some other risk factor, you know. And so they tried to control for the factors that they can and found that those women who reported that they took a multivitamin um, had a higher risk, a lifelong risk of breast cancer. And they think it's the folate. And, and similar, a finding was found with men in prostate cancer taking multivitamins. And in that case, the thing is the zinc um, in the multivitamins that's increasing men's risk for prostate cancer. Why would folate increase one's risk? Well, the, we, we, you don't get folate in pills. You get something called folic acid because folate is not shelf-stable. 
But our liver takes folic acid, which is what's found in pills, and turns it into folate, which is what our body uses and what's found naturally in greens and beans. But they said, no one's going to eat greens and beans. This is the United States of America. So we need to fortify, we need to put vitamin C in the grain supply, excuse me, uh, folic acid in the grain supply, in bread, pasta, etc., by law to make sure um, people get enough because no one's going to eat spinach. All right, but that was based on the assumption, that was actually based on rat studies, and rat livers are really good at turning folic acid into folate. And it, so it, it took until, I think, two years ago, I actually have a video of it on the site, it, two years ago, until they actually looked at human livers. And the reason it takes a long time, I mean, you, basically the only way you can study a human liver is you wait for someone to donate it, and then the transplant person is unavailable, and so all of a sudden you have a liver. So quick, let's test it. Let's throw some folic acid and see what happens. And it turns out that human livers are about 40 times less efficient at converting folic acid to folate. And so what happens is you have these high circulating levels of folic acid in your body before your liver can finally make it into what your body uses, and we think it's that folic acid that's actually increasing cancer risk. At the same time, of course, folic acid and folate decreases one's risk of, uh, of a certain type of birth defect. And so women of a childbearing age, to get a source, a need to get folate, I encourage them to get it from beans and greens. If you refuse, then sure, folic acid, but uh, we should try to eat healthy as the, as the default option. And on that note, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Greger, for making the latest findings in human nutrition so fascinating and delightful. Not to mention profitable. <laughs> yes, I won one. <laughs> in case you're wondering, I plan to share my new riches with you. <laughs> if any of you have any questions about the original papers upon which Dr. Greger's findings that he reported on were based tonight, please let me know because I've got them now. We'd also like to invite all of you to have some great vegan refreshments courtesy of Down to Earth. Mahalo to all of you for coming tonight and have a safe return home. Night, everyone. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.